So when we're talking about boring conquerors, you know, like I'm in, uh, Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 verse 37, he says, but in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. But he speaks about all the suffering. He speaks about from suffering to glory. And he speaks about going through a whole bunch of stuff in life and going through this difficult stuff in life, you know, like suffering and going through tough things in life. But he gets to the end and he goes like, but in all these things, we are more than conquerors. In other words, the suffering that I'm going through, the things I'm going through, is not affecting the fact that I'm a conqueror. It's affecting my life, maybe what I'm going through. And it's not saying that God doesn't care when we go through life. God doesn't care that we go through tough times. But but it's about knowing that when we go through these things that God is with us that he actually does care that he actually says that I see I count the hair upon your head you know like and that's how much he cares about us he says I see you for before the foundations of the earth I knew who you were that's how much I care about you but I also see what you're going through and in that same thing I can give you the power to become more than a conqueror and living in victory every single day it doesn't matter how how the life is knocking you around or how things but it's all about having that mindset that we are living in victory every single day and so this journey we're going to be walking through the book of um, Ephesians you know where we're talking about sitting with God the first part is about we sit with God then we walk with God and then we stand with God and sitting with God and then we kind of talk about how we can how we're going to sit walk and stand at the same time sitting with God is basically having relationship with God everything that we do comes out of a deep relationship you know like when we even come to worship when we come into the presence of the Lord we come out of that place of man I've met with God I've sit with God but it's not just sitting with God just like every now and then it's sitting with God on a daily basis and so this morning we're going to discover a little bit more about, about sitting with God. And so Ephesians chapter 1 to 3 focus on our position in Christ and our relationship with God. And these are scriptures and, and, and things that just declare about who we are in God. And I'm just going to go through a few of them quickly. If you have your Bible, you know, you can go, you can turn with me, you can just go through some stuff. Paul starts in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heaven, the places in Christ. And what Paul is saying, he says, the first thing I want you to understand is that you have been blessed with every every spiritual blessing that's in heaven and so when Jesus walked the earth he was blessed with every spiritual blessing that's in heaven now when he talks about us he's not talking about like um people think about like oh man I've been blessed with heaven so now I'm going to declare kingdom to come down I'm going to walk on gold streets Jesus didn't walk on gold streets there wasn't like pearls walk running around and rivers and stuff and lions walking next to him they don't want to eat him but he had a kingdom mindset and that's why he teaches us he says like as we christians just prayed like thy kingdom come thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven and so it doesn't matter what i'm going through it doesn't matter what situation i'm facing i firstly i know that i have been blessed with every spiritual blessing that's in heaven in other words that's a kingdom mindset that we're walking within that that man god has blessed me you see whether i have one dollar in my pocket of five cents in my pocket I am blessed because why God has blessed me with every spiritual blessing and so what Jesus did in his time is that he basically just ushered the kingdom of God into places where he went into and that's why he says like I can only do what I see the father do I can only say what my father tells me to say because what he was speaking from he was speaking from a heavenly perspective and that's why when Jesus walked in, in earth he knew that in heaven there were no such thing as leprosy Come on. And so that's why he healed that leprosy because he's been blessed with every spiritual blessing. He knew in heaven there were no blind people. And that's why he healed the blind because why he goes like, I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. And so when we're looking at our prayer life, when we pray, our life is elevated because why we're not just praying from an earthly perspective, but we're now praying from a heavenly perspective. We're praying, we're declaring, whatever is in heaven, God, I want to declare in my life here. Lord, I might be sick right now, but in my mind I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing and therefore my mind and my body will not overtake my spirit but my spirit will rule my body my spirit will rule my mind because my spirit lines up with the kingdom of heaven and unless our spirit lines up with the kingdom of heaven we will never be able to live a victorious life he also says that 
we are made for the praise for his glory in other words what he's saying that like you know what you when God looks at you he will start praising because you are made for the praise of his glory and that's why he says let your light shine so others may see and your father in heaven he says in him we have redemption sorry I'm not giving scriptures in him we have redemption this is now I think verse 7 if I can see correctly in him we have redemption through the blood through his blood for the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace and we're going to talk about the blood in, on a later stage but it says like we have redemption through the blood in other words every time I do something wrong every time I go through something I declare I say God come and wash me in the blood of the lamb I've been redeemed redeem means like I've been purchased things have changed in my life then he said also in verse 13 he says in him so in chapter 1 you were also trusted after you heard the word of truth of the gospel of salvation in him also having believed you were seated with him <laughs> sealed with him with the promise of the holy spirit and so now he says like there's a promise and it's a seal and that seal means it's a done deal that you've been sealed with the promise of the holy spirit then in verse then in verse 20 it talks about it says like which he worked in christ when he raised him from the death and seated him at the right hand of heavenly places far above principality and might and dominion in every name that's on earth and is in heaven and now it tells us that Jesus has been placed in heaven at the right hand he's far above every principality we're going to talk about principalities in the later states he's far above every power in other words everything that is going on in this world everything that we're facing is under the feet of Jesus but it's whether we believe or whether we don't believe and now he talks about also and in him all things were put under his feet so everything was put under his feet then we jump to chapter 2 we're going to continue and he talks about and he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus now that's my most favorite part about Ephesians that we've been raised up together in other words when I'm being raised up together and I'm seated with Jesus within the spirit I don't pray from an earthly place but I pray from a heavenly place in other words I don't look at the mountain this way I look at the mountain that way and so when I already pray and I pray for something my faith is elevated and I already believe because I'm now in heaven and I say to God God in heaven that problem doesn't exist in heaven so I now want to declare on earth that this thing must move this thing must give because why it is not heavenly you know how many people are walking in struggles and are bounded by things I'm not saying we're not going to get sick but I'm talking about not being bounded by the sickness that's why Paul says I go through sickness I go through hell I go through all these things but in all these things I am more than a conqueror in other words I can lay on my deathbed and I can say to myself that I am more than a conqueror because my body is just a vessel but my spirit goes on and it's all about when we start thinking about spiritual mindsets you know like and not earthly mindset because a lot of the times we are bounded by the earthly mindset but God wants us to be elevated you know for these things now one of the things we need to understand is that that these things were given to us these blessings are provisions for us to enjoy every single day that these blessings are given to us to walk in victory to walk in power and not to be bounded by things my thing is not working well just press it here it's not good for the recording, Wawa. <laughs> and so we are now walking in everyday blessing. And so every day is blessed. Now I want to make it very clear. And I speak about this very, very much. The blessing is not the materialistic things. Those are just added things that we get. The blessing is Jesus. And when I have Jesus in me, I am blessed. We must believe what we read. In other words, this thing only works when I believe it. But, it but it works better when I apply it and that's why I love reading the Bible and applying the Bible and so when I'm going through something in life I'm going like into trouble and I'm sick I'm going like man I have been blessed 
with every spiritual blessing that's in heaven. And therefore now I can read it. I can say to myself that, you know what? Everything is placed under the feet of Jesus. Every principality, every dominion, every might, every power. Because I want you to understand that we're not just living in a world here. We are living in a spiritual world. Every single day, there's demons around us. Every single day, we are facing principalities. Sometimes you might be in an argument or in a relational issue, or you might be fighting a battle, and you don't know why you're not getting through. Because it's not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. And so when we understand, first of all, that we are spirit, and our battles are spiritual, and, not, and I'm not saying now, go look for a demon under every rock and under every chair. You get what I'm saying, you guys? I'm, all I'm saying is that our battle starts spiritual first before it becomes physical. And once you win the battle in the spirit, you can win it in the physical, not the other way around. You see, once we understand and I believe that I can be healed, that is when I'm healed, not the other way around. It is even when I take a tablet and when I'm sick and I take a Panadol and I pray over that Panadol, I say, like, Lord, I take this Panadol, but I believe that it's you that's going to heal me through this Panadol. And I don't believe in the power of the panel, but I believe in the power of the blood of Jesus Christ that is healing me. And this is just something that helps me to get to the place where I need because you created this thing. You know, like you made this thing. It's, about, it's all about how we pray. And so the next thing I want to talk about, first of all, is that we are being, we are, speaks of three things. We are being seated. Speak of three things. So the first part we are going to be talking about is sitting with God in heaven. And that speaks of three things. What does it mean to be seated with Jesus? What does it mean to come from a place of heavenly perspective, from a kingdom perspective, and to pray within that? And so let's journey together in this whole thing. And so the first thing we need to understand is that those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. You get what I'm saying, you guys? We will reign in life, and life will not reign over me. If I have the flu, the flu don't reign over me. I reign over the flu. In other words, I used to be 10 knows I used to be a person that's not a morning person. But I also used to be a person who gets very moody when the wind blows. Every time the wind blows, it affected my mood. I get angry, I get upset, I get frustrated, and I'm just moody because the wind blows. But we have one problem with that, with that type of mood. I grew up in Cape Town, <laughs> the Cape of Storms. In other words, the wind blows every single day. And so every day I'm angry. And so I allow the elements of this world to reign over me. And one day God corrected me. I remember walking in Jeffreys Bay and the wind started blowing. And I'm, now I'm living on the beach. Now you know when you live on the ocean, the wind blows every single day. And I remember walking there and the wind starts blowing. And I feel myself getting angry and upset. Like, mm, why is the wind blowing? And I want to kill the world and rip everything apart. And, you know. And next thing I'm, the Lord said to me, what is wrong with you? You're allowing the elements of this world to affect your spirit. Instead of your spirit affecting the elements of this world. As believers, we are called to usher the presence of God wherever we go. We are called to change the atmosphere wherever we go. And I started having this belief, wherever I go because I carry the light of Jesus, darkness must disappear. You see? Because I am the light. And so when I walk into a place, I must affect the atmosphere, and the atmosphere must not affect me. I remember, um, Ted knows, when we got married, um, we lived in a place called Jeffreys Bay. It was a very racist place, and we couldn't even rent a house because, of, because I'm black. They wouldn't even give us a house. And she knows that, like, so we struggled even getting a house. And we were being abused. Many times people would walk past us and, and say awful things to us, you know, because why she's married to a black man. And I remember having to walk this journey, you know, like, uh, I don't know if you remember one day this you drove past us and these guys, they just started calling me names and abusing us and making fun of her, walking with a black man. And, and all I wanted, and I saw this rock and all I wanted to get up is get this rock. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm going to pick this rock up and I'm going to jump on top of this youth and then I'm going to just do what I do best when I used, what I used to do before I was saved, you know. But I had to learn that, you know what? This will not reign over me. What they say about me 
about the color of my skin. What I say about my wife being married to a black man will not, will not affect me, but I will affect that. And I remember we moved into a very racist guy's house next to us. And Ten made me go watch right by the guy's house and he wouldn't even let me sit on the, on the, on the couch. I had to sit behind on, on, to watch the game on a, on a dance thing. And he had a carpet place. And I made a constant decision. Every day when I walked past his shop, I couldn't remember his name, but I would say hello to him and wave at him. And the guy would be like, mm, every time you'd see me like, and every time I would see him outside, it's like, hey, how are you doing? Like, mm. you know, like, why is this black guy talking to me? But I made a decision that I will not let that reign over me because I have the presence of God. God has called me to reign over the situation. God has called me to reign over my feelings. God has called me to reign over my mindset. God has called me to reign over my insecurities. God has called me to reign over my weakness. You know, like I might be going through these things, but it will not reign over me. That man became my good friend later on. Few months later, I would walk past his shop and he would be like, hey, Etienne, come in and hug me. Because why? All I did was like, I'm going to reign with love. I'm going to show love to a man who hates me for the color of my skin. I'm going to show love to a man who looks at me and looks at me as a subhuman. You see, God can use us. When we allow things to reign in our lives, when we allow our, our family lives or things that to reign over us, we will never overcome. And so the question is really, the question is really, um, can you please move on? The question is really, are you, are you reigning or are you a slave to your circumstances? This is just an, an amazing story. You can see, the, do you recognize that one guy there with a the hat on there? <laughs> That's Wawa. Wawa started preaching on the, on the trains in South Africa. You know, and um, as you can see, that's a DTS outreach there, on, and, and we got to that place, and Wawa can tell you the story, you can confirm everything I'm saying here. And as we were getting there, we were just going to do like some evangelism, and we saw a guy with a speaker there, and we was like, hey, can we use your speaker? And as we start praying, the witch doctor starts coming, and he starts doing all weird things. So we're praying in a circle here, and the witch doctor comes like, whoop, wow, whoop, whoop. And he starts throwing like his witchcraft stuff. So we're praying here. The witch doctor is attacking us from here. And so the girls are looking and they're going like, mm, what's going on here? You know, and so suddenly we're in this atmosphere where there's Muslims around us. The witch doctors are there. The unbelievers are there. And we're about to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. So eventually I started walking away from the group. I started walking close to the witch doctor. And I just started rebuking. It's like, in the name of Jesus, go. And he started going like, oh. And he goes back and eventually disappeared. And so then we started preaching. And then as we were preaching, this woman walks past, as you can see. And so I'm just starting calling up, like, these are like students like German and from Finland. And so we were on the train before we even got there. We were on the train, and I started getting us like, okay, you get up and preach. There's a bunch of people sitting here, and they start preaching. And then Wawa did his first preaching in the train. And, and I remember Wawa started shouting, and he shouted, Cape Town for Jesus. And when he started Cape Town for Jesus on the train, the whole atmosphere changed in the train. And we started leading people to the Lord on the train, praying for people on the train, and things just happened. And we end up here. And as we were fighting and trying to get against the atmosphere, and there's Muslims right in front of us and all these things, God starts, God starts moving. And that's why I said that like, all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so when we started making an altar call, people started coming out, as you can see there. And then we didn't have enough people to pray for people because by revival, it started work breaking out on a marketplace in an open air that we didn't plan, but we were just ushering the love and the presence of God. And I remember like, um, I remember one of the girls, he was praying with one of the ladies there. And, and I look at the side and one of the ladies started becoming demon possessed and the head starts going like, and the head starts spinning around and they're looking at me and I'm going like, no, you guys pray, I didn't wake up that demon, you deal with that demon. If you wake up the demon, you deal with the demon. You know, and they started casting out demons. People were getting healed on the street there. But you need to understand, it wasn't just like that. We walked into an atmosphere of witchcraft. We walked in an atmosphere of Islam. We walked in an atmosphere where people were just there. But when we started declaring the name of Jesus in that place, and we started saying, and these are students just coming out as their first time. They've never even preached in a church. They've never even given a testimony in the church. But they were so scared, and they were getting, and, and, and one of the boys, I, I didn't even want him to preach. He just jumped up and he's like, give me the mic. 
And he started sharing the love of Christ. And they started changing the atmosphere. And we saw heaven opening up. And we saw revival breaking out within that place where there's too many people for us to pray for. That we had to get other believers come out and help us pray. Finding believers within the crowd to come and help us pray. Because why? They overcame their fear. When Wawa got up on the train that he didn't know he was going to preach in, when I just said, like, Wawa, it's your turn, get up and preach, he was full of fear. He was scared, but he didn't allow the fear to overtake him. And when he started preaching, and he started declaring, Cape Town for Jesus, and the atmosphere just broke, bang! We reigned over the atmosphere. I believe that God is not just called us to reign over our lives but to reign over the atmosphere. Being seated with Jesus in heavenly places means as we've been lifted up with Jesus, we also reign with Jesus. My question again to you is, are you reigning in this life or is this life reigning over you? Whatever you're going through, whatever circumstances you're going through, is that reigning over you? Why are you reigning over it? It doesn't mean we're not going to go through trouble. It doesn't mean we're not going to go through struggle. But it means that we are reigning over these things. And these things are not reigning over us. The next thing what it means to be seated with Jesus is that we are on the other side of the finishing work of the cross. I love the cross. You know, I was just in a church lately, and the pastor spoke about the blood. He spoke about the cross, and I was like, man, I love this. You know, like, I just want to hear more about the cross. You know, so Paul says this. He says, I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in death. And so some are obtained the resurrection from the death. And then he talks in Colossians chapter 2 verse 10, he says like, And you are complete in him who is the head over every principality. I want you to understand, first of all, you are complete in Christ. You are not a half a person. You are not a little, uh, three quarters, but you are complete in Christ with every spiritual blessing. But he says, I want to know Christ. What does it mean to know Christ in the power of his resurrection? And that means you live on the other side of the cross. You, because Jesus says to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And that's why even when we do evangelism, when we witness out there, we cannot do it without the Holy Spirit because we're doing it with the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit that empower us to do certain things. But in order to have that power, I must die at the cross first. I must understand that, you know, like, not dying is that I must humble myself. I must come to the cross and say, Lord, I lay down everything in order to have the power of the resurrection. And so death and power goes together. But this is a sweet death. This is not just a death that we're just going to go and suffer forever. This is a death that leads to victory. A death that leads to glory. A death that leads to power. Is when I say to Jesus, simply Jesus, I surrender. I, Etienne, die before you. And we know as we were going out and doing evangelism in Australia and Peter then they went out like they had to die and going like I don't talk to people I don't like talking to people I'm not used to talking to people but that person dies for it's no longer I that lives but Christ that lives within me and therefore Christ makes decisions within me and therefore I don't do it within my own strength anymore and so sometimes I go out and I say like you know what I really don't like talking to strangers on the street but I'm not going to do it in my own strength. I'm going to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. If I can't do it, then He can do it through me. And it comes simply by humbling ourselves. And we need to take our rightful place at the cross, you know. We need to understand that what Christ has done at the cross. We need to understand that He's already done everything. You know, like we were... At that moment, I took that picture in Palestine, you know, like being in Palestine, being in Israel, Palestine. And that was the day, the week I was there was the week when our wonderful President Donald Trump decided to move the embassy to Jerusalem. And so you would have seen what has gone on over the, in the time. When we were in Palestine, we could hear, we could see the lights, we could see bombs and stuff like, woo! And we are there with a team doing outreach. But understanding that even in the midst of the war, that Jesus has won the battle on the cross. And people thought, like, are you guys crazy being in Palestine, being all these things? 
even within that we knew that people needed Jesus in Palestine and being there with the team and having a wonderful time in Israel and in, in Jerusalem and in Palestine and worshiping God and understand that no matter what we go through in this life there was a cross 2,000 years ago you see when we enter into healing when we enter into revival when we enter into victory it's something that is in, that has happened in the past tense that is operating in the present tense and into the future tense and so everything I know every end answer I'm looking for, it's already been done upon that cross. That that cross is empty, that Jesus died upon that cross, and in that cross he said it is finished. But now we need to receive the finishing work of the cross and understand that I can actually walk in the power of that cross. That that cross is powerful. The next thing that um, sitting with, with Jesus means is resting. That we're not at a place of struggle, we're at a place of rest. You know, I think we talked with Chris and just we had a wonderful talk about yesterday, just about rest. He says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 29, he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and, lead and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see, having that rest within God in the midst of trouble, Having that rest, being able to go and sleep, you know, like when you know that all hell breaks loose, is understanding that God's got everything under control, that He is the ruler of the universe. I cannot, I can rest within Him because I know what is done upon the cross. I can rest within Him because I know I'm seated in heavenly places with Him. I can rest because why, when I pray, when I look at my circumstances, when I look at the situation, I look at where am I seated. Am I seated on earth, spiritually, or am I seated in heavenly place? You see? And there's rest in heaven. And what does it mean to rest? Resting is a natural response that the job is done, it's completed. Resting is understanding that, you know what? I'm facing the situation. I'm going through this warfare, but it's been completed 2,000 years ago. And I can just walk in this victory. It's a place of rest and not a place of worry. You know, they, I think they say there are 365 verses in the Bible that says, do not worry. <laughs> and so when we start worrying, we are doing exactly the opposite of what Jesus is commanding us to do. In other words, it's safe for me to say every time I worry, I sin because I go against God's word. Now worrying and concern is, are two different things. Don't get me wrong. I can be concerned or I can get a little bit worried, but when I'm in a state of worry, constant worry, you know, like, for instance, if I see one of the children get on that chair, one of the babies, and they're going to jump from that thing, of course I'm going to get a bit worried and run towards it. I'm not saying we're not worried, but I'm talking about when we live in a state of worrying, when we're constantly fearing, when we're constantly worrying, is constantly dwelling in our mind, you know, like, then we are walking against what Jesus says, because he says, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry, because while you are in a place of rest, in a place of rest, there is no worrying. We are convinced that nothing can undo the completed work of Jesus Christ. And so I start looking at this word, and I'm going like, you know what, within this word, nothing can undo what Jesus has done for me. He has done it, and therefore, I can sleep at night. I can go to rest at night. I say to people a lot of times, you know, when we were looking at this mortgage of this building and looking at a whole bunch of stuff, I said, I prefer to lay awake and think and, 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 and strategize how we're going to win the loss rather than how I'm going to pay the bills. I want to put my eyes on what God is doing and what God wants to do through me rather than things that I cannot change. I want to focus on Him and say to Him, Lord, I give this problem to you and I lay this problem at your feet. And when I lay it at your feet, I'm not going to worry about it anymore because you will take care of it. Now I can move in. Now when we stop worrying, we stop walking that Jesus has for us. You need to know that you can rest in the presence of the Lord and that you are safe there. You need to know even in the place of warfare that we can rest in that place. When we say it is finished, it is done, when we rebuke it and we say, Lord, it's over, it is over. 
because what he has done it upon the cross. Therefore, we have this promise. It says the gospel, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith who heard. In other words, all of us can hear this word. It's what we do with this word. It said the word didn't work for them because why they didn't have faith within the word of God. And I want to encourage you today is that have faith in the word. You see, I look at God's word like a boat for me. You see, it's, if God builds the best ship in the world, and sometimes the ship will sail, and I'm on the ship, and the water is still, and I'm happy. And sometimes the water is stormy, and there's storms happening, but I know who built the ship. <laughs> and I know that because the one who built the ship, the ship will never go down. So even in the stormy water, I know, like, I see the storm, I feel the wind, I feel the rain, I see the thunder, I see the waves coming, but I know who built the ship. And therefore, I trust in the one who built the ship. Because he is a good builder. He is the cornerstone of everything that we have. And so when we understand that who we are in Christ, you know, and when we see that. Now, the things that the Ephesians talk about, the Bible describes us like this. He says we are God's sons. In other words, I'm not an orphan. I don't have to go back. We are saints of God. We are God's possession. We are God's workmanship. We are fellow citizens according to the kingdom of God. We are members of the household of God. You know, isn't it, isn't it amazing being members of the household? We are His holy temple. We are a dwelling in which the God lives by His Spirit. That God's Holy Spirit lives within you. You know, and, and I've seen God do incredible things in this room. I've seen God using people who don't even know Jesus to lay hands upon the sick and the sick are being healed because of what God can do. I've seen God raising up the blind. I've seen God opening up the deaf ears. I've seen God raising up the cripples. Not because of me, but because of the Holy Spirit that lives within me. I often tell people, the first time I saw blind eyes open and crippled people walk was the first time I had the least faith. Actually, I wanted to run away from the situation when I found myself in a village in Africa. And I'm standing in front of a crowd of people and making an altar call and saying like all those who are sick coming out full of faith. And when I saw blind people come out, I almost fainted. I was like, I didn't mean for blind people to come out. <laughs> I didn't. And then I made the altar call long and I said like, is there anybody else who's sick in this place? And then they brought deaf people. I'm like, this is not getting better. And then I had to prolong the altar call. I said, like, is there anybody else who's sick over here? And they bring crippled people out. And I'm like, it's getting worse and worse. And I'm like, where do all these blind and crippled and deaf people, where, where, where do they all come from? And they're all in the front of me. And then I started asking, is there anybody who's got TB? Is there anybody who's got cancer? Is there anybody who's got flus? Any sickness that you cannot see? It's not visible. Because all I can do is say, all the cancer people are being healed. All the TB people are being healed. Sorry guys, the Holy Spirit has left the building. We'll come back for the blind tomorrow. But it didn't work like that. And I remember standing there, and this altar call is going for more than half an hour, about 40 minutes, because I don't know what to do with all these sick people in front of me. And I'm thinking like, okay, I'm going to ask everybody, close your eyes, lift up your hands and close your eyes. And when they close their eyes, I'm going to run. I really wanted to run. By the time they open up their eyes, like the elbows have left the building. And then I realized that I'm in the middle of Madagascar. I don't even know where to run to. I'm in this village, even if I run, they will catch me. And I remember breaking down before God, and I had no faith. And I remember just dying there. And all I could say is like, Jesus, Holy Spirit, you come. And when I did that, with a little mustard seed of faith, not with great faith, with my cowardness, because I was a coward, and I was scared, and I was fearful, but I said that I have the Holy Spirit. I remember this, something came over me and I walked to the first blind person and I said, see in the name of Jesus. And the person starts crying and jumping up and down and the eyes are opened up. 
And I started, a man, one man's hand was like this clip. I start pulling this man's hand out, and God starts healing his hand. And I go to the deaf people, I lay hands on the deaf, and they, deaf and they are being healed. And I remember there was one person who was born blind, and I, and I don't even know why I do it, because this is when the Holy Spirit starts moving, crazy things happen. I said, is there a Malagasy Bible? And I walked to this blind lady, and I said to her, read the Bible. I just opened the Bible somewhere, and, and her eyes opened up, and not only does God heal the blindness, but she started reading the Bible for the first time, was born blind. That is the God that we serve. But it's about all about the Holy Spirit. It's all about understanding that it's not about how much I pray. It's not about how much I fast. It's about who I trust in. It's about, it's about that mustard seed faith. And I want to encourage you young ones that you have massive faith. You, you can have faith and you can go out and you can do amazing things. Not because you want to do amazing things. Guys, let me tell you one thing. I don't want to see, get, see people get healed so I can tell people can be healed. Because Jesus loves them. And it's a deep compassion and a deep love in my heart. And I truly want to see them set free. I don't want to see people get saved because I can come and say, oh, oh, we've had like a thousand people get saved. It's because Jesus loved them. And it's a love that's in my heart. And when I receive that love, that love flows through me. And many people want to see healings and salvations, but they don't want to see the love of Christ flow through them. Everything Jesus did was out of love because he is love. It wasn't because he wanted to be great and wonderful and give testimonies like, I've done this, I've done that. It's simply because he loved and he loved well. And so the next thing we understand that's very important is that we... We have a position in Christ. And so being seated with Christ talks about our position in Christ. And I often explain this in a way that if I walk out the street right now, I can't just go and stop cars and say, show me your license. But if I'm a policeman, they can do that. <laughs> because they understand their position. They understand their, they understand their job. And as Christians, so un we understand our identity very well, but often we don't understand our position. And the first position we have that I just want to run through is we have been redeemed through His blood. There is nothing the enemy can do or to do to you that you have truly been redeemed. When I became a Christian, because why I've done so many bad things. I had to learn Romans chapter 8. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit has set me free from the law, sin, and death. When I used to become a Christian, everywhere I look, I would see people that I've shot. I would see people that I've stabbed. I would see people that I've hurt. And I would keep reminding me, that is not who you are. I feel remorse. I feel sorrow for what I've done. But I've been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, when we are redeemed through the blood, the blood didn't just redeem us from sin, but the blood also redeemed us from sickness. The blood didn't only redeem us from physical sickness, but the blood also redeemed us through our grievances. You know that it redeems us through our thing. He says like he took our grievances to the cross. And by his stripes we are healed. And so often when people talk about it, they just talk about the physical thing. But even sometimes when I'm sad, when I'm grieving, when I've got something going on in my mind, that Christ has taken that to the cross. And it's just like, I've thought about your grievances and you've been redeemed. There's so much power in the blood of the Lamb. And that's why often when I pray, I say, Lord, I just plead the blood of Jesus over this situation. I plead the blood of Jesus because the blood of Jesus is what redeems us. Because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, it says like we're overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And so we need to understand the power of the blood. That I've been chosen. And so every time when I feel inadequate, every time I need to do something, I feel like maybe I cannot do I realized that, no, the Bible says that, Etienne, you have been chosen. When people said to me that, you cannot be a missionary because you're black, I have been chosen. I said, no, 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 no. You can say what I am. I've been chosen. When they said to me, you're an ex-gangster, you're an ex-this, and you didn't even you know, finish school, how are you going to preach? How are you going to do this? No, the Bible says, I have been chosen. When they said, Etienne, you've got a big stuttering problem because I used to stutter a lot. I said, I have been chosen. In other words, no matter what you say about me, and I want to encourage you, that no matter what people say about you, no matter what they call you, you can say, but the Bible says, I have been chosen. When they says like, oh, you're too young, or you to this, or you're not, in, you're not good enough to do that, you guys like, I know that, but I have been chosen. Remember, David wasn't even invited to get anointed, but God chose him. 
You see? He wasn't even invited to the party. Everybody else was invited and everybody else was looked at. But God chose David. He chose the youngest one. He chose the one that nobody believed in. And I want to say to you that God has chosen you. And you can say anytime when you read the word, anytime we want to do something, and anytime the devil tells you something, or whoever tells you, your mind says something, your mind says, you know what, I'm not able to do this. You can say, I have been chosen according to the word of God. Jesus chose me before the foundation of the earth. He says, my position, that's my position. My position is I'm included in Christ. I'm marked with a seal of the Holy Spirit. I'm called to hope and therefore I will never live in a state of hopelessness. Because I'm called to hope. The hope of glory lives within me. And when I feel hopeless, I say, Lord, let the hope of glory manifest within my life. Because where I am hope. Because hope lives within me. I'm saved by grace. That's my position. I'm raised with Christ. I'm created in Christ to do good, do good works. I'm brought near through His blood. Therefore, I want to encourage you, sometimes we feel we're far from God. We feel God is distant. All you got to say is like, Jesus, wash me with your blood. Bring me near with your blood. And my feelings doesn't matter. It's what I know about what the Word of God is saying. You can never be far from God as a Christian. Isaiah 59 says, My arm is not too short to help, and my ear is not too dull to hear. But he says, But your sins has come before me. And the only way to remove that is the blood of Jesus. When we say, Lord, forgive me, wash me with the blood. And when the devil tells you, or when you tell yourself that, Man, I feel far from God, you can take the word of God and say, But the word said, I'm brought near by the blood. So no matter what I hear, no matter what I feel, it's what I believe. And now I believe I'm brought near with the blood. I'm able to approach God with freedom and confidence. That's what, God, that's what Ephesians says, like when you read Ephesians chapter 1 to 3, it says like, and we are come to God with freedom and with confidence. And therefore my prayer it's not pray, God, maybe. God, you might. God, maybe you want to heal. God, maybe you want to rescue. No, 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 no. He's already said it. I am doing it. So I come with confidence declaring what God has already said. There is no maybe. There is no... Let me tell you, God always wants to heal. There is no excuse for God not healing. <laughs> I don't know why people don't get healed sometimes. I can't answer that question. But what I do know is that I can always come with him for confidence. And even when sometimes something doesn't happen today, I'll come back tomorrow again. And if it doesn't happen tomorrow, I come back the next day and say, God, you said in your word. The beautiful thing about God is in his word, it says like where two and three are gathered in his word and what they agree upon. It's in heaven and agreement. And that's why when we pray, the reason why I love going through the word and I'm, and I'm just reading this thing that's in this thing is because why I'm not just talking my own words. I'm giving God's words back to him. <laughs> I, I'm saying, God, this is what you said. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't come up with it. Therefore, you cannot tell me no. No, no, you said it. You said I can come to you with confidence. You said I must lay hands upon the sick and they can heal. So come on, that's your word. I didn't come and write my own things. And that's why when I pray, I love praying the word of God, even in my prayer. Because I, I declare what he has said. And the last one is that I'm loved by Christ. Doesn't matter what the devil tells you. Doesn't matter how you feel. That he will never, ever stop loving you. That God always loves and he always loves us and he is love and he will always be love you know and so when we're looking at these things we are seated with Christ we are raised up into heavenly places with him and so our prayers start changing from a heavenly place and that's why when Jesus did say like I said in the beginning when he did say when you pray you say our father hallowed be thy name and that name is a name above every other name 
that name is called Jesus. And so when I say, hello be thy name, I said, Lord, they thank you for that name, Jesus. A name that's above every other name. A name that every other name, it doesn't matter what you name the problem, what sickness you made up, that name is above that name. And so now I lift up the name of Jesus, and I say, in the name of Jesus, because you say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, the sick will be healed. You say, in the name of Jesus, the dead will be raised. You say, in the name of Jesus, the blind eyes will open. So I'm not coming in my name, but I'm coming in the name of Jesus. And I declare that name of Jesus over my situation. And so sometimes when I wake up in the morning and I feel down and I feel I can't face the world, I say, you know what? I'm feeling down. I'm feeling depressed. But there's a name above my downness. There's a name above my depression. And I declare that name that everything that I'm going through right now will submit to that name because why it says like everything will submit to that name. It said, in by that name, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And no matter what principality, no matter what power, and that's why I say like, hello will be thy name. And then it says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And I say like, Lord, the way I feel right now, do you feel like that in heaven? Are the angels walking around, downcast, heavy burden, worried in heaven? If you ever heard of an angel being walking around, say like, oh, I'm so worried. I'm so downcast in heaven. No, they don't. And therefore I said, Lord, because why that doesn't in heaven, I want to declare what's in heaven in my life right now. So I'm elevating my spirit. I said, Lord, lift my spirit. Let me be seated in heavenly places so I can be looking down from heaven and tell my body and tell my mind that you will come in alignment with the spirit of God and the kingdom of God and start ushering the kingdom of God. And that's how I start my day. That is how I move through a situation. It's simply by saying that, this doesn't exist in heaven, and therefore it will not exist in my mind, and therefore it will not exist in my spirit. But God is greater. God is bigger. We serve a wonderful God. People, when we're talking about spiritual warfare, yes, we're talking about casting out demons out there, but the greatest warfare, if we're going to be talking in the next few months, is in our minds, it's in our hearts, and it's in our tongues. That's where the greatest warfare lies. And that's where the enemy wants to keep us trapped. You see, if I can't, I used, to, I, used to play, I used to play sport. And when I would run on the field, and we play rugby, and I see the other team, I have to believe in my mind that we're going to beat that team. If I walk in the field and go like, oh gosh, we're going to get a flogging again today. Then we're probably going to get a flogging. <laughs> you, know, I, if, you know, I remember like... We were once in Brisbane, and um, there was a soccer game between the Solomon Islands and, um, and Australia. And we're the Solomon Islander guy. And I, and I looked at him, and he came to me, and he goes like, and he was so excited about the game. He was like, and I said, and I said are you sure you guys are going to win this game? He goes like, yeah, we're going to win. I was like, you Solomon Islands. Are you sure you're going to win? I said, like, I know you've got faith, my brother, but there's faith, and then there's foolishness. I said, like, this is not faith. But he had so in his mind, he believed that Solomon Islands were going to win. And he was so excited about it. And I was going like, you're not going to win. I was like, yes, we're going to win. Yeah. And they lost by nine to zero, like almost like a rugby score. Nine points to zero. But I was so impressed with him. Coming from a little country, thinking that we're going to win. But you know what? They might have lost the game, but he's won in the mind. He has not walked in inferiority. He walked as an equal and saying like, you know what, we are good enough to win this. And I want to say to you that everything that we do, which we're going to learn in the next couple of weeks, starts within the mind. But it starts with our spirit. You know, when our spirits are being elevated within heavenly places, and we start praying from a spiritual place. Let's pray together, and then we're going to have some, some praying more. Father, we want to thank you this morning. Lord, we want to give you glory.